Hey girl, hey, it's Nurse Rini, your birth bestie, and I am back with another class for you. If you enjoyed the last one on Pitocin, definitely stay tuned for this one because I get so many questions about this particular subject that I figured we should make a video about it. But if you have not watched the Pitocin video, go ahead and go back and watch it, then come back here. This information is for you so that you can be well informed and make the best decisions for you and your baby. So let's dive in. So today's subject is chorioamnionitis aka choreo and I get a lot of questions about it so I know it's a big problem I don't know the rate at which people get choreo but I do feel like it's quite frequent so we're going to talk about what it is how you get it how it's diagnosed and what you should be concerned about so what is choreo choreo is an ascending infection that means it's an infection that works its way up through the vagina into the cervix and then into the uterus so choreo starts in the lower vaginal tract, right? So closer to the opening of the vagina, and then it works its way up the vagina into the cervix or through the cervix and then into the uterus. So that's what an ascending infection means. And that's what choreo is. Now choreo isn't any one type of bacteria, rather it is the name for an intrauterine intraamniotic infection. And choreo itself is just that, but the infection can be many different sources. It just really depends. And once the bacteria works its way up into the uterus, it's usually going to be an issue of an infection once your baby's water has been broken. However, you can get an intrauterine infection without your water being broken. It is commonly known that your water is usually broken when you do get a choreo diagnosis. So some signs and symptoms of choreo would be mom has a fever, aka you. You have an elevated heart rate, which is called tachycardia. The baby has an elevated heart rate that we can see on the fetal heart monitor. And so that's fetal tachycardia. Uterine tenderness is also a sign of chorea or a foul smelling vaginal discharge. These are all signs, but it's not limited to all of these things. It could just be all of these things or a couple of these things. So it's just really going to depend on how you present to your medical team. So as you can see in this picture here on the screen, we have the vagina, which is the cylindrical opening that you see, and you see the bacteria working its way up into the baby's environment. So that's how choreo works. Let's talk about some risk factors for developing choreo. The main risk factor for you developing choreo will be your water being broken. So if your water is broken, then you are already at risk for developing choreo. Then if your water has been broken for a prolonged period of time. When we say prolonged, we say we mean like greater than 12 hours. If you have multiple cervical exams, you are going to be at increased risk for infection. And that's because though the doctors do use sterile gloves to do a cervical exam, if you have bacteria in the vagina, which we do, that's normal and natural. If we are pushing that bacteria up the vaginal tract and to the cervix, then no matter whether or not you have sterile gloves on, you're going to be at increased risk for developing choreo. If your labor is longer than 12 hours, if you have internal monitors, and we talk a little bit more about internal monitors in our course that we offer, make sure you ask about that down in the comments, but internal monitors can increase your risk for infection. If you just think about it, right, we're introducing a foreign object into that safe space, which would have been the bubble around the baby. And then if you're GBS positive, that's already bacteria. So if you are group B strep positive, that's already an, an existing bacteria, which is only going to fester and grow, potentially cause you to have an intrauterine infection. And lastly, but definitely not least, will be meconium stained fluid. And meconium is the baby's first stool. So a diagnosis of choreo doesn't actually happen until after you have the baby. We just take the signs that you present with clinically, that fever, that elevated heart rate for you and baby, or uterine tenderness or foul smelling um, vaginal discharge, and we make a diagnosis based on that. But your doctor won't actually be able to confirm that you have choreo until they send your placenta, which you know comes after the delivery of the baby, they send your placenta to the pathology lab and then they test it. There are different levels of choreo. So there's like the normal mild, you know, choreo infection, which is so bad, but then there are levels to it. That is diagnosed by the pathologist. So I often get the question from women in my DMs asking what caused it. And I always tell them you have to go back to your doctor or ask the hospital to give you your medical records or log into the patient portal. And there you will be able to find specifically what bacteria was diagnosed in the pathology report. So of course, if you have choreo, then you are going to be at risk for many things. And first we're gonna talk about mom. So mom's risk include 
increased risk for C-section. And that's just because your uterus may not be functioning and contracting very well if it is infected, right? Like when we have an infection, we don't feel well. We aren't our best selves. And so we aren't performing at our best and at our highest level, right? And so that's going to be the same with the uterus. Also though, if you have choreo and you are remote from delivery, meaning you're like three or four centimeters, and it's going to be quite some time more before you become completely dilated and able to start pushing, then your doctors will want to probably go ahead and get the baby delivered because you don't want to hang out in an infectious environment for too long. However, it is important to know that choreo diagnosis itself is not a reason to have a c-section. So if you're like six or seven centimeters, eight centimeters, and you have choreo, they could potentially still let you labor and deliver vaginally. It really will just depend on how your labor is progressing, how you feel, and how baby is showing up on the fetal heart monitor. Of course, if you have an infection, then you will continue to have inflammation of the endometrium. So you may have endometriitis. You may also have an increased risk for a postpartum hemorrhage. Again, the uterus is not functioning well because it's sick. And so part of the uterus's job is to contract after you have the baby so that it doesn't fill with blood. But if it's sick and it's infected and it's not contracting well, then that does increase your risk for a postpartum hemorrhage. And of course, with anything invasive, with any kind of surgery, there's always going to be a risk for infection. However, if you have an infection such as choreo already, then you may be at an increased risk for a wound infection. So an infection developing specifically where you had your surgery. But you and baby are connected, right? You are connected to each other. And so if you are sick with an infection, then your baby is also going to likely be sick with an infection. So if you have a fever, it's not uncommon for babies to come out and also have a fever. And so your baby will be treated for infection, but sometimes the infection is pretty bad and it can develop into sepsis. Of course, if your baby has an infection, then there are other sequelae of the infection that happens. When you are sick, what happens? Your heart rate is impacted, your respiratory, your breathing rate is impacted. And so all of these things can also then become an issue for baby. They are just little, you know, miniature people. And so they kind of present the same way that we do, except breathing is always going to be an issue for them when they are ill. Fetal death, unfortunately, is a potential complication of choreo or prolonged infection. So if you have choreo, your baby will be treated with antibiotics and blood cultures will be drawn and sent. So you're like, Rini, why are you telling me this? What is it that I can do to keep from getting choreo? Well, there's no surefire way to keep from getting choreo. However, there are some things that you can be mindful of. That includes being mindful of what time your water broke. And I say that because not everyone's water breaks with a big gush. Sometimes it's just a trickle. And so sometimes moms aren't really sure that their water has broken. So I always tell clients, if you are leaking and you're not sure what it is, or you're not sure if your water broke or not, it's always better to err on the side of caution and go in and get checked because you don't want your water to be broken for a prolonged period of time without you being aware of it, okay? I've seen people come in with their water broken for like two days and they just didn't know. So there are other risk factors that come with that in addition to choreo. So definitely if you think your water is broken, then just go ahead and get it checked to make sure. People pee on themselves and think their water has broken. It's fine. That's normal. We expect that to happen sometimes. So if you come in and you're like, I think my water broke. And we're like, oh no, it's just urine. Oh, or it's just vaginal discharge. Don't feel embarrassed. That's completely normal to, that that happens. But it's always going to be better to find out and know for sure whether or not your water has been broken. Talk to your provider. Be very open and have candid, honest conversations with your provider. Say, hey, I'm concerned about getting choreo or I had choreo in my last pregnancy. I want to make sure that we limit cervical exams to what is absolutely necessary to do so that I can decrease my risk for infection. They will be totally fine with that. They will only check your cervix as needed. And as needed means different things for different people. It just really depends on what's happening with you and your baby. But let them know, this is my concern. I would love to limit cervical exams if possible. And if you are able, move around so that we can help labor progress. You know, get into those different positions, do some walking, do some movement. And if you have an epidural, totally fine. Just get in different positions within the bed and your nurse should be helping to facilitate that. So they'll help you do that. So I hope that this module was very helpful to you. Let me know if you learned something new. If you did learn something new, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe because this is what we're here to do. We're here to educate the girls, educate the masses, to make sure that you are making informed educated, evidence-based 
decisions. So do me a favor, like, comment, share, and follow for more information like this. Bye.